So I'm Professor Reed from the Primary Healthcare Directorate and I'm a family physician. I want to speak about the referral system and how it works in this country. Uh, and it would seem to be fairly simple and straightforward, but I think I want to introduce a bit of complexity to your understanding. So uh, at a simple level, if somebody gets ill, they often look for help within the family or their local community. And if that doesn't work, they'll go to the first level of care that's available, and we call that the primary level of care. And that's often a GP or a, a clinic sister. Sometimes it's a traditional healer uh, who's in the local neighborhood. If that doesn't work, the, the idea is that uh, a person, a uh, patient, then gets referred up the chain to the secondary level of care, which is usually a hospital staffed by doctors, and if that doesn't work, then uh, for the sickest patients or the most needy would get referred even higher up the level to a tertiary level of care such as Fritz Gear, uh, where there are specialists and subspecialists to attend to their needs. Now, that would seem to be fairly logical, but it's not so straightforward because people really battle to get access particularly to the primary level of care. Uh, and what we found in analyzing patient stories uh, and uh, understanding the difficulty of accessing the system is that it's a lot more complicated than it would seem to be. So we analyzed, for example, 230 children who ended up in the pediatric intensive care unit at Red Cross Hospital. So these were the sickest of the children, and the thing about children is that they can get very sick very, very quickly. In a matter of hours, they can go from relatively well to very, very, uh, very, very ill. So we looked at each of these uh, referrals and how the children had ended up so sick as to need admission to ICU. Uh, and what we found was that the biggest barrier was what happened at primary care level. That is, the decision to seek care in the first place. Is this child really sick or not? How do we know? These are the decisions that are made by family members and non-medical personnel, so non-trained people. How do lay people know when a child is really sick enough to need care? And that's an issue of patient education and community awareness. It's also uh, some practical things like knowing the uh, emergency number to call the ambulance. Uh, now, some of us know that that's 911, but others uh, don't know that or don't have access to a, to a phone. So there are barriers there and uh, quite significant barriers. But even having, having decided to seek help, uh, accessing care is not so is not so easy. So first of all, the GP is going to require a payment. You know, have you got enough money? A private hospital asks for your credit card uh, before the patient is seen. Um, but there are issues of of transport, of distance to the nearest clinic. There's the issue of staff attitudes, and uh, some of the patients caregivers told us how they'd been really put off by. Uh, uh, nurses' attitudes to to their children and uh, dismissed as being uh, making trouble for no real, real reason. Meantime, the child was extremely ill. So there are those barriers to uh, to gaining access into the system, and we saw stories of, of of patients trying again and again to to get access in, into the system, waiting, for example, with a very sick child covered sometimes with a blanket for eight hours in the waiting room before somebody took notice and realized that this child was significantly ill. So at that primary level is where a lot of barriers exist and uh, I think we need really to address those waiting times, those warning signals, find in a, in a crowd of, of people those who are really sick. How does the referral process work within the system? And it's not as simple as you might think. 
Uh, a referral process involves a set of communications that are often carried through the referral letter from, say, a GP to a, a, a hospital or from a clinic sister to, uh, to the uh, district hospital that they normally refer to. And that referral letter is really important. Uh, what goes into that letter, how it's phrased, what sense of urgency is communicated by that letter, what facts and, and figures are, are given, because that carries the information, the, the clinical information, that's needed to make uh, the right decisions. And so the referral letters is really important. Equally, uh, those referral letters need to be replied to, and the, the information of what happened to the patient, or the child, or whoever it is, uh, once they reach the referral hospital, needs to go back to the primary level of care to say, you sent this patient to us, thank you for referring, it was an appropriate referral, the child was in fact very ill and needed uh, uh, intravenous antibiotics and was admitted for three days, uh, for example. And uh, uh, that strengthens the level of communication between the, between the levels of care. Uh, it's exceptional that a child needs, or an adult, uh, any patient, needs to be referred further to a secondary or tertiary level of care, usually for specialist opinion. And uh, that needs to be accompanied by a very detailed uh, referral letter that outlines exactly what has happened to date, all the results, uh, the initial assessments, clinical assessments, uh, in order for them to be able to take over care and manage from, from there on. And again, it's fraught with difficulty. It's mediated also by the ambulance service. So the length of time that it takes, for example, for an ambulance to arrive at a clinic uh, and, and, and take a patient to the, to the nearest hospital, that's an issue of, of great concern. Uh, the target is to get every uh, ambulance to arrive within 90 minutes, and sometimes they meet that target, but often they don't, especially in rural and remote areas. So this issue of referral is not as simple as it seems. And once you experience that in the clinical role, uh, you will see that uh, referrals is a huge uh, area of frustration for clinicians. Uh, getting that communication going, getting the uh, um, feedback that is necessary, and uh, all the logistics that go into referring, uh, sending patients, sometimes over huge distances, uh, to get the care that they need. So there's an enormous um, infrastructure that involves ambulance, ambulances and helicopters and uh, all of the emergency medical services that's dedicated to making the referral system work, especially for acute and urgent cases. But then there's a whole other area of uh, transport and logistics around non-urgent cases. Uh, patients, for example, coming all the way from upcountry to attend a, a highly specialized clinic at Kreutzkirche. There's a lot of logistics involved because that journey itself takes a day. They have to sleep over in Cape Town, attend the clinic, sometimes sleep over a second time before they can get the transport home. If they live, for example, in Beaufort West, that's an enormous journey. Uh, so these things are, are really fascinating. They're in the area of health systems and it's a responsibility of all of us to make health systems work as best as they possibly can.